thank you for joining me today to talk a bit about research in uh, religion, spirituality, medicine. It's a mouthful. I may use RSH from time to time. That's what it stands for. also want to thank Gail and the uh, entire OCamper executive board for just pulling off another really good conference. A lot of work went into it. Behind the scenes, it's all volunteer work. So um, when John, so he kind of got back at my dad by roping me in to do to revitalize OCamper eight years ago, and uh, I came kicking and screaming. But uh, the, the the fruits of that are that uh, we help bridge uh, the organization to what it is today, and to see the growth that that we've seen over the last couple of years is really shows. Uh, what the new board is doing to to move things along. So uh, I recently gave a 10-minute talk to uh, during a one-hour grand rounds at the VA on moral injury and uh, tried to expose that to primary care. And even though a lot of us may not know about it or have a great interest in it because we don't see a whole lot of patients with it, there's still a lot that I think we can transfer over. Um, I mean, moral injury, what is it? Uh, this is there's an extreme form of it with our veterans. But there's all sorts of moral injury. And, you know, how many of us don't cross moral boundaries here and there? I mean, uh, what is sin and all that? So uh, I, I will, um, I'm hoping that a lot of what I cover today will be transferable information and help our skill set in multiple arenas. So um, what happened, I was going to prepare a whole new talk to tell you the truth with a whole new PowerPoint uh, that would include an orthodox sort of take on things, I put some icons in there, pictures of St. <laughs> Luke, of St. Ferropol, and some monasteries and all that, uh, and give it a different feel. I didn't have the time to do that. And the reason for that is recently I had some surgery and I'm still recovering from that. I just didn't have it in me to do a whole new talk. So what I did for the VM, kind of bringing here, did change things around a little bit. Um, I, I wanted to take a minute to thank Mina for uh, beefing up and fixing my old PowerPoint a little bit and making it more presentable. So thanks, Mina. Uh, I had wanted uh, to add my, as I said, my usual old camper presentation and take on this, which I tried to do last night. And we'll see how it comes out. Anyway, uh, I do apologize for all this and, and not having fully prepared to tailor the talk to the description you see on your handout. Um, just FYI, I heard about moral injury right here at O'Camper two, three years ago from Father Sean Levine, sitting right behind Dr. Demacus. And I was so impressed by that. Uh, Father Sean, as you, some of you may know, is a four-tour combat uh, vet, uh, is a major in the U.S. Army. And if anybody knows moral injury up close, it's Father Sean. And thanks for putting it on my radar screen because you started this whole thing going for me personally. Um, uh, by the way, Grand Rounds on Wednesday uh, was very much like an O'Camper conference forum because it was the first time in my 22 years at the VA that we had medical, psychology, and spiritual care providers all presenting at the same lecture. I really enjoy working at the VA and deeply believe in its mission of clinical care, education, and research. Uh, I will interest you to know that Dr. Demacus, he doesn't want me to talk about this, but um, you know, while starting as a cardiologist at the Heinz VA, he quickly went up the academic and, and, uh, and uh, administrative ranks and wound up leading the charge on getting good evidence to take better care of our patients. And what I mean by that is he, he headed off HSRD at the VA nationally, came up with these 13 or more now centers of excellence. And so, but his true love is the church. And that's why he got me involved in OCamper and why he's been present for 30 years in the organization. Um, so, you know, you all have your mentors growing up. Well, my father's definitely one of them. John is one of them. Gail is one of them. I mean, the way I see her pulling this off. But they're in the ranks with Roger Bone and William Oslo and all those great, great folks. Uh, one last comment before I start my, my talk. You know, um, I, I, listening to Dr. Jenkins, uh, I have to add him to that list, too, because I've been at the VA so many years and heard so many stories from all the wars. And I've taken notes through my uh, encounter with living history in my exam room hearing from patients, but I realized how little I actually knew when I heard uh, Dr. Jenkins speak about um, 
his experience is, someone so up close and personal to the demanding and harrowing experiences of a combat trauma surgeon. It's given me a whole new appreciation perspective of all my work at the VA, and, uh, and more recently on the work I'm doing moral injury as well. So this first slide is, uh, is the brochure for a 150-year celebration of excellence at VA Maine that took place in September 2016. Uh, VA Maine was the first VA in our nation. The land was sold to the government in 1866 and was the first of three branches of military asylums established by Congress for disabled veterans who fought in the Civil War and served veterans from all around the country, not just Maine. I pulled this off a VA website, President Lincoln's Promise, with malice towards none. John, you've heard this a thousand times, uh, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it for the rest of the folks here. It's worth hearing. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us the right to let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. With the words to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, President Lincoln affirmed that the government's obligation to care for those injured during the war and to provide for the families of those who perished on the battlefield. So to bind the nation's wounds, I never paid much attention to the first part of the promise with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, to bind the nation's wounds. Uh, we are duty-bound to care for patients we have put in harm's way. I don't think just for veterans, but any, I mean, when, when we talk about the visible and invisible wounds, we, you know, we, we're thinking, uh, I mean, all of us, and I, this is where I'm hoping that some of what I'm talking about, the VA, we, we can transfer out to the uh, private sector as well. Um, so the, the uh, you know, uh, the VA has been delivering holistic care by both clinicians and, collabor uh, and pastors collaboratively for years. So the second slide, um, what impressed me on, on this uh, slide was um, that the care of disabled Civil War veterans, quote, the facility fed, clothed, and gave religious and secular instructions to the men. So from its earliest days, we, we, uh, we see this. Um, okay. So how does a primary care physician get interested in religion, spirituality, and health, and moral injury? Just to briefly give you my background on my interest in moral injury and subsequently interest in research in religion, spirituality, and health, uh, I've been interested in combat since I was young, visiting Crete, Greece, and heard stories about relatives from who survived World War II in Crete and the Greek Civil War after World War II. Then growing up in New Jersey and New York during the Vietnam War also made me think quite a bit about combat as we had family friends that served and it all made me wonder what it would be like to be in combat and always glad never having to be a part of that carnage and fear being protected from it like most of us. During the Civil War it was called Soldier's Heart. In World War I we called it shell shock, World War II battle fatigue, Korea operational exhaustion and Vietnam PTSD. In the past 20 years and during the more recent wars, we've defined and redefined moral injury per Dr. Shea and Litz as follows. This is Dr. Litz, quote, perpetrating, failing to prevent, bearing witness to, or learning about acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations, end quote. I was very proud to uh, show this slide at Grand Rounds and explain what we do here in terms of working together as clinicians and pastors. We've been working with chaplains in many settings, but generally not as much as we should in the outpatient medical and surgical settings, so that the idea was to bring moral injury to the attention of our colleagues during that presentation. The VA does some things very well, such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, substance abuse, PTSD, and mental health in general, but the concept of moral injury is pretty new. Before getting into the numbers and research, a quick comment for those unfamiliar with what moral injury really is, a bit beyond the formal definition. For us in primary care, the discussion of the clinical importance of moral injury and its distinction from PTSD was best described as follows in one of the social work journals that I reviewed. 
whereas with PTSD, the injury generally results from a brush with or a potential for death or mutilation, that is, acts committed uh, against the patient or witnessed by the patient, leading to severe anxiety and other symptoms. In moral injury, the act is committed by the patient, acts which violate the patient's moral beliefs, codes, and values, resulting in shame and guilt that can lead to PTSD. But you can have the one without the other. Generally, following violation of a moral boundary, there is guilt which is a private emotion and comes first, that is, my behavior was bad. And this can lead to shame, which is a public emotion, that is, that I am bad. I found this framework useful to understanding moral injury as a new concept, imperfect and underdeveloped as it might be. In, in the early 20th century, around the time of Freud, we stopped addressing moral issues as external factors and identified guilt and shame as a focus on morality that was felt to be paternalistic and blaming. Today, if a patient experiences internal conflict over crossing a moral boundary, we are bound to help them confront that boundary, the patient's boundary, not ours, so that we have come full circle. And for those of you who have not seen the movie The Ground Truth, it is a must-see movie on how we train our young adults in boot camp to come out as part of one of the world's most efficient killing machines, the U.S. Armed Forces. It is the best way to see up close and personal what exactly moral injury is, in, uh, is as an introduction. So I thought of this slide. Um, I thought that this one was important to see uh, so that you get an idea of the prevalence of... Um, so you get an idea to see the prevalence of moral injury both inside and outside the VA. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to jump right down to the last line. And um, in a panel of about 1,200 patients, which is the target panel size in many VAs, each primary care physician has about 90 to 100 patients who, uh, a, 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 that who may have served in direct combat and who may have had moral injuries. So if we see these guys once or twice a year, we, or we can have up to 180 or 200 visits a year. So there's plenty of opportunity to, uh, to offer them an option that generally goes unoffered. When I went through this math mathematical exercise, I realized that even though these numbers are estimates, this is such a common, this is a common enough entity that we should all at least have it on our radar screens, learn to identify and address it, uh, and especially in the VA given our demographics. So, um, but the numbers do indicate that 16 million veterans are not cared for in the VA but out in the community, and that 1.2 million patients may have been in direct combat, and many of these suffering moral injuries, so that clinicians both inside and outside need to know about this fairly new entity, how to identify and respond to it. So these next three slides brief speak, uh, uh, speak briefly to moral injury. The first shows a list of qualitative studies uh, taken from a PowerPoint from a chaplain, Dr. Dreschner, from the VA National Center for PTSD. And this one shows findings from the studies that show signs and symptoms of moral injury based on the type of combat experiences. I guess I could spend a little more time with this one. If any one of you want a copy of this, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, again, remember these are qualitative studies. They don't have the power of some of the quantitative studies. Uh, the well, all of this should be in the proceedings of the conference. Okay. So they'll all get it. They should get this. Right, right. Um, okay, so quantitative, quantitative studies have... Um, Many of them, these are just three, have shown that moral injury um, is associated with higher rates of PTSD, depression, suicidal ideation, and attempts negative affect and less social support. Um, these next few slides leave moral injury in specific and speak to research in general about religion, spirituality, and health. And what really finally speaks to the topic I was designated to speak about today. Um, so here are some more important numbers. 87% uh, of the world's population is affiliated with a religious group. 76% of the U.S. population holds certain beliefs. 53% attend religious services. And to me, the most interesting of all these numbers is that 80% of acute psychiatric patients report using religion to cope with distress. These slides summarize research done at Harvard's McLean Psychiatric Teaching and Research Hospital. 
These show significant numbers of patients reported uh, an interest in discussing spiritual and religious matters with their treatment team, even if they had no religious affiliation, and in spite uh, of what is considered to be an irreligious locale. As a result of these findings, McLean now takes the approach of asking all their patients whether they would like to discuss religion and spirituality in the context of their treatment. This slide shows interesting numbers from a survey done at Duke on patients' attitudes towards religion, spirituality, and health. While nearly one in five don't think their physician should ask about, uh, should ask about, and about one in four think that religion and spirituality uh, and medicine should be separate, a large number believe that MDs should ask about and consider the spiritual needs of their patients. In a survey of medical school deans in 2010, we see 90% of the schools had content in religion, spirituality, and health. 7% um, have required courses, and almost half believe that their schools need more. I'm sure that today it's far more than that. Um, so in August, the VA sent me to a conference at Duke to learn about research in religion, spirituality, and health, uh, and quick quickly learned that well beyond O'Camper the, and the VA HSR&D programs and Duke, there are major me academic medical centers around the country that have similar programs of research on RSH, and speakers at the conference in August came from Harvard. All these have their own programs and research in this area and conferences. Um, well, all of these, Johns Hopkins, uh, George Washington, where Christina was Christina Pukowski is another big name in research in this area. She's been around for decades and doing great work with, with it. Um, and finally, Yale. And um, this gentleman down here uh, is a professor of internal medicine and pediatrics, came and spoke to us about burnout uh, in uh, physicians and clergy. Let's see, what else do we have? So um, I guess this is the key slide. Um, oh, just, just a little pitch for this course. I mean, if anyone here, whoops. If anyone is interested in a course that touches on uh, the uh, re re research in relig RSH, it's really a good idea to take a hard look at this program. It's very well done. They call folks from all over the place uh, that are experts in the field. So, and it's a lot of fun. It's a, and and here's the syllabus for it. If any of you are thinking about pursuing this a little bit more, it's very thick. If you want to take a look at it later, come and have a look. Tell uh, Harold Koenig. So he's a, another well-known name. Harold Koenig, Christina Bukowski, both are leaders in this field. So um, the two of them really ought to do a program together one year. Um, so a systematic review, uh, and these next two slides are the key slides, I guess pertinent to the original uh, title of the talk today. Um, they're very important. Every so often Harold Koenig will uh, review all the research done in the field. So they tell you never to quote an article more than five or ten years old. Uh, some of these articles are much older, but every so often they have a whole new collection and literally he reviewed hundreds of articles from all these academic medical centers. Um, uh, these, this review included papers from Harvard, Columbia, Duke, and, and many other places. The author discusses the findings from the research on the effects of religion and spirituality in three major domains of health. One is mental health, which uh, includes almost everything you can think of. Um, Well-being, purpose in life, hope, optimism, self-esteem, depression, anxiety, suicide, and substance abuse. The second uh, domain um, looked at health behaviors such as exercise, diet, smoking, and risky sexual activity. Uh, the third, physical health, such as coronary artery disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. This one is hard to see, but it's the, um, what this shows are the hundreds of quantitative studies um, 
this one this one shows the number of studies that showed a positive association of religion, spirituality, and health. No association or a negative association with health. And these include entities from all three domains and in every one of those uh, sub-areas that I mentioned. So although you will find articles uh, that showed over on the right, by the way, he separated them out based on quality of studies. So the higher quality, all studies include everything. The higher quality studies just basically showed with, I, I believe, in even a stronger association. So. Um, these um, we can we can, we can go through these, but that's the bottom line. And and um, what it concludes, what he what he writes in his conclusion is a quote: uh, a large and growing literature base has demonstrated that religious involvement is positively related to mental, behavioral, and physical health. Uh, and much exciting research is now being done documenting the importance of uh, religion, spirituality, the health of medical and psychiatric patients, providing a rationale for identifying and addressing spiritual needs. So uh, moral injury in our population at the VA should not go unaddressed. That's the point I made on Wednesday. And especially when our patients are reluctant to ask for a referral to mental health or to the chaplains. So um, helpful provider characteristics in primary care. Um, importance of rapport building. Some of these are self-evident. Cultural competence balanced with not assuming you understand. I mean, we haven't been to combat, so we can't understand. Be an active listener instead. Uh, Dr. Rossi really put that well yesterday. Um, the willingness to ask hard questions, to live with ambiguity, comfort with discomfort. At first I wasn't sure what Dr. Dreschner meant by this, but I think what he means is we have to be ready to deal with the uncertainty of how a patient might respond if you offer him a referral to the chaplains or spiritual care. Thank um, and But most importantly to me is the best care is collaborative. So at the VA, basically, we're recommending uh, making a recommendation to do what we've been advocating here in Ocampa for 30 years, which is collaborate uh, everyone together, you know, to take care of a patient. You need the, f the medical folks, psychological providers, and you also need the uh, pastoral care. Um, so uh, of note here, I wanted to mention that Dr. John Oliver at uh, the VA down at Duke made a really... Uh, a point, made a point of board certification for all chaplains that they get evidence-based training um, to dispel any reluctance to validate cooperation with mental health and medical professionals because there is still a lot of reluctance in the outpatient medical and surgical side to deal with the chaplaincy service. Um, so let's see. Uh, little by little, we're actually putting together a team that will include chaplaincy, mental health, primary specialty, and surgical care to create a curriculum for peers and trainees on communication and collaboration with our patients uh, about uh, working with our spiritual care providers. So caring for patients with any entity that we discern may need the chaplains on board will likely involve the following five steps. Asking, about, uh, our, asking our patients about the importance of religion and spirituality in their lives, um, both now and in the past, understanding our limits, uh, knowing about research, uh, religion and spiritual care provider resources and what they do, and use this knowledge to describe these resources to the patient and, and also clear up misconceptions that they might have, such, such as that chaplains only care for people from their own traditions and that they proselytize. And finally, five, screen for referrals based on three screening questions. Uh, but with all these screening questions, it will be important to distinguish between those who uh, have an existential struggle and those who don't. If walls go up, we respect that and leave the patients alone. We drop the offer to refer as quickly as we raise it. Um, this is a good time in my comments to discuss a conversation I had um, with a, uh, a chaplain that was covering Dr. John Oliver. I had called him. He had invited me to, to, uh, to approach him and ask him. Uh, I was very curious about 60% of the patients that lose their faith in combat and how do they work with folks that have lost their faith but have somehow 
they're willing to speak with a chaplain. And if they establish rapport, he it did not concern this. Uh, Dr. John was not there. Uh, I, I got one of his trainees. He was uh, in the doctorate program. And he was just awesome. I, I don't know if I can replicate what he told me there. But he said, look, we take these guys literally by the hand. We descend down into the deepest depths of hell with them. And we bring them back. And when they do, a lot of those symptoms that they had that you saw on the qualitative slide, they go away. Depression, substance abuse, they get their faith back in God, they can forgive and be forgiven, they can get intimacy back. They never, they th never think of themselves as being worthy of intimacy uh, because of things they've seen, done, and approved. Um, for one, moral injury, this I heard down at, uh, in Durham, moral injury for one patient was not um, being a soldier in the battlefield, but was going to, um, with his friends and colleagues, to prostitutes. He really had trouble with that. And for the sake of the cohesion of the unit, there was no way to say no to that. Um, but for, there, there are different areas, and that's why I think so much of what we find out about moral injury, we should know about here in Ocampra, because it can involve so many other aspects of life. Um, so, this is the binding of the nation's wounds Lincoln was talking about that requires all of us to work with one another collaboratively, clinicians, pastors, and chaplains, to take care of the most afflicted, be it from moral injury or any other disease. We should be aware of some of the current treatment options in moral injury so that we can discuss them in general and briefly with our patients if there is an initial interest. They are divided into evidence-based treatments, such as prolonged exposure, PE, cognitive processing therapy, CPE, and emerging treatments, such as the ones you see here on the slide. Especially interesting to me is adaptive disclosure, which, yes, there's sacramental confession, um, and there's, um, there's disclosure. And they're very similar. They're, they're, they, they have um, collaborative effects if they're done professionally and if they're done sacramentally or even non-sacramentally but to a chaplain somehow. So um, these are very powerful uh, new emerging treatments. The other one that I find very interesting is spiritual cognitive processing therapy, which is still experimental. It's down by a Duke with uh, Koenig et al., but it's emerging as a, um, an evidence-based treatment modality. Um, so this, I don't know how many of you have seen this circle of health, anyone? This is a good one to have in our exam room because it'll remind us if we're in the middle of a busy day, at least us in primary care, we have so many tasks to do with each individual case. You don't think of uh, co-op, collaborating with others outside, uh, of the, uh, outside of your own little world, so to speak. So um, this, is, this slide is, is about the wholeness of health of a patient, which depends on self-care, professional care. Those are the two narrow circles around the, uh, the uh, patient in the middle. And self-care, which is the biggest circle. And it, within uh, self-care, um, it includes all these other entities that you see here. Uh, I'll read them all for you because this is a slide is hard to read. But it includes things like feeding and growth of the mind and spirit, exercise, nutrition, rest, personal develop, and relationships. So, um, I mean, how many of us in primary care think about faith-based or community-based resources in, in the middle of such a busy day? Um, so, for folks that are interested in learning more about the invisible scars of war, there's an expanding volume of literature, and all you have to do is search Amazon. These are copied and pasted right off the page. Um, uh, but I do recommend that you speak to a mental health provider who knows the literature and get your own sort of uh, referral. There's, there's just too many books out there. One of the, the one that I like a lot that, um, uh, that has been helpful in understanding everything involved here is really, it's called On Killing by Dave Grossman. Some of you may have heard about that. I believe it's required reading for all federal employees that may have to take life. And um, it's just beautifully done. He takes you through the psychology before, during, and after training in combat. 
and all the fallout from, from it. Um, and finally, to conclude, so in the past several decades, we have learned to work with chaplains in the acute care inpatient settings, where patients are often very sick, in hospice, in setting where patients are beyond very sick, and working with mental health for many years. But working with our spiritual care providers is still missing in our outpatient medical and surgical clinics. Uh, I said on Wednesday to a VA audience, quote, that uh, what better way to bring this collaboration with the chaplains in our outpatient care work than through identifying and responding to moral injury that so many of our warriors have coming home with these invisible wounds. And having come full circle, we're doing, uh, we're doing basically what uh, the VA has always done, we're just doing it better, and that uh, was my concluding statement. Here at Ocampra, I'd like to alter my concluding words and bring the spiritual message home a bit more. Here we deal with the science and theology, the evidence and faith, with clinicians and pastors. And I believe it is a very good thing for us as Orthodox clinicians and pastors in the community to be aware of the evidence from research and religion, spir spirituality and health, not just for providing the best possible medical care, um, psychological and pastoral care, but also for our credibility uh, in being the face of Orthodoxy in the world where the rubber meets the road, where every day in our, our clinical encounters and working with our colleagues in the community. And um, to this, what we bring as Orthodox, and, and add to this what we bring as Orthodox to our patient encounters, whatever that is, however we've lived our faith. Um, and, you know, we've basically then done all we can. And um, that's it. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Very thoughtful presentation. Your father will be proud of you. I'm sure he is anyway. And by the way, Maine is not the first VA hospital. Get that out of your mind. No, well, all right. So let's. Uh, it was a we public health hospital. Out. What's that? First, it was pub first public health hospital. Oh, okay. The government built. First VA, yeah. 1932, Hines. Really? They took over the public health hospitals. Okay. That was the first one they did. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> questions yeah, for Michael. <laughs> questions for Michael. So, Michael, are they training medical students in moral injury today? Well, the students that come through the VA and come into my clinic get trained, but a lot of the primary care docs don't know about it yet. I was talking with Father Sean about this. We're trying to put it on the radar screen. I'm sure that the residents and students that come through the mental health service side are hearing about it for sure, but not on the medical side. Yeah. I'm surprised with that. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll change that. Um, at, so at UMass, you know, we have as third years modules that we go through, and there's one related to mental health where we're trained on uh, specific questions to ask, very similar to what uh, you know my dad presented for the uh, for like the three. You know, do you want to discuss it? Do you want to bring it up? I'd never heard the term moral injury, uh, but I've seen a little bit of data on it being uh, good to ask and patients wanting you to ask. I think that was the major point of what they've been training us yeah. to do there. That was Alexander Christakis, by the way, for the Yes. Please state your name. Elizabeth Ashton. I'm a retired VA nurse from West Roxbury, and I worked uh, spinal cord injury for um, about 15 years there. So um, I just wanted to share that uh, irregardless of you know, the structure that we're trying to create. The nurses or even the aides would go and pray with the patients. They would be there because they usually work the night shift. So um, sometimes the aides would bring in their Bibles and read the Psalms to them because nights are the hardest. So sometimes, um, you know, even though we're trying to create these wonderful opportunities, you know, Within the structure of the VA, the people, God, God covers, you know, everything. And you try and prioritize, but um, God will put you where you need to be at any certain time. So, you know, your faith kind of carries you through your nursing or through your medical career. 
that's what I wanted to share. Thank you for sharing that. Other comments? Father. I'm Father Theodore from uh, Southern Missouri, and you and I have had a chance to talk a little bit. Yeah. This topic of moral injury is very interesting because in the past year, well, in the past couple of years, I've been working in addiction recovery and especially the psychological implications underneath. And in the past year especially, I've been working with uh, women who are recovering from drugs and alcohol, but also women who have been rescued from human trafficking. And this moral injury is really important with them because not only are they dealing with substance issues, but they're also dealing with this is not the way they were raised, right. you know, once they were taken away from their families. And so the, I'm very interested in this topic now to look more deeply. And you spoke about shame and guilt, which is a topic of my paper later today, uh, and the connection with addiction. That um, the, If I might read just one little section from yes, a woman who's uh, recovered yeah. uh, or is in recovery, and this, this uh, concept of spirituality is extremely important. And this is her own word. She's, uh, uh, she was helped by Hazelden and her name is Stephanie. She says, uh, shame and spirituality cannot exist at the same time. One cancels out the other. Shame separates us from others, from God, and from ourselves. Without spirituality, we are profoundly alone in the world. And so, for me, this is what dealing with moral injury is all about. You know, as as a chaplain, as a pastor, just to be able to help them understand they're not alone, they're not abandoned. And so, any material that you have that can help (laughs) me understand moral injury better would be. We can stay in touch. I know where to get and where to go to get it now. Uh, Alexander helped me with a, a, a program that you can download onto your computer and start saving articles and you can put them into files. I can't wait to start using that actually. Um, you, know, you know, Michael, let me interrupt you a minute because yeah. Gail is here too. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. And I wonder if we shouldn't make OCAMP a repository for many of these articles yeah. and. Um, yes talks. Gail, you know, we're talking about, so we have a group of um, hospital chaplains, of doctors. A camper can be do much more by being a repository for these type of articles, which can be hard to find, especially early on now, the beginning of discussion, things like moral injury. Let's get everything out of here under the Ocamper website. Yeah. Yeah. Get away from you. Yeah, no, I think uh, we've talked in the past about the different ministries that O'Camper would like to do and what we're able to do because, oh, as I said earlier, I, I, Gail, I, you weren't here when I thank you and the whole board for pulling off a great conference, but the conference is the focus for all our efforts in this volunteer organization. But we've come up with a list of 10 or 11 ministries we'd like to do, but we can't do it because the manpower is not there. Uh, that's a sales pitch, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, the wonderful opportunities that we have in Ocamper to bring all these interests together in one place. We want to be evidence-based. We want to be the best in clinical care. We want to be the best in psychological care, know how to manage these folks. Uh, you know, but we also want to be the best pastors and the, offer the best in spiritual care, which we have in the Orthodox Church. We have just incredible resources to help folks um, you know, during our encounters inside the church and outside the church. Uh, Father Sean Levine, a military chaplain, and just kind of piggybacking off what Father said, I make this point in the art, in my chapter that just came out in the book that we, we talked, that we printed from last uh, meeting, um, that there are, there are different, I love that, that image that spirituality, shame and spirituality can't exist, can't coexist. And it just kind of flipped my mind as we were sitting here, talk, we, we talk about warriors losing their faith, and really they don't lose it. They just, they, they're very, very disoriented. They are temporarily extremely disoriented by the shame and, and the guilt that they feel uh, from having perpetrated things that, that, con- that are contradictory to a moral code they may not even have known existed before they did the act. You know, a lot, a lot of guys I've talked to, when they pull the trigger, and they, they either watch somebody fall or they don't really know if they, if they got anybody or not, but they feel like they, they did. Um, something happens inside of them that they did not anticipate. They thought they were going to be perfectly fine with this. I'm trained to do this. This is my job. I'm good at it. And then something breaks inside of them when they, when they, when they you know, kill somebody else. And, and the shame that then floods into the soul, it blinds them to their faith. And so a lot of times we approach this from a very cognitive perspective, and we try to do this cognitive restructuring to get them back on a right cognitive plane. And in reality, that, it, that doesn't, you know, when you try to show somebody a beautiful picture and they're blind, 
you know, you can, you, can, you can keep sticking it in their face all day long. Their eyes don't work, and they can't see it. And so I think, the, 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 in my mind, the analogy just shifted from a warrior losing his or her faith, I don't believe anymore, to somebody who is now really blind uh, mm-hmm. by their own, their, their wow. shame displaces their spirituality, and, and you can't just shove those two things back together. And to me, it makes work with moral injury so much more poignant because when you begin to help them clear the guilt and shame in legitimate ways, the eyes open again, and there's their faith standing right in front. It was there all the time. They just simply couldn't, couldn't see it, and thus they can't access it. And so the, the two things stand, they displace one another. And, uh, of course, as you begin to open the eyes again and the spirituality steps back in, it starts to become a resource to work with moral injury. But if you go at it head on and just say, well, if you just believed, then you could get forgiveness, then you'd be fine, that, that equation really doesn't work very well. Um, you have to start working with the moral injury and begin to open the heart again, and then all of that wonderful resource of spirituality can come flooding back in and, uh, and, and, and begin to become a resource again. So the idea of, of shame and spirituality being unable to coexist is very, a very powerful image for me and a new one. And that's very helpful to me, too. I don't remember if I mentioned it earlier, but when, these, when I mentioned the 60% that lose their faith, uh, the chaplain did note that the framework is still there from what they had before. So what you're describing is, a, I think, a much more thorough explanation of uh, what's going on there and why and how we can still help these, these guys. So I'm Gloria Terziska, and I work with eating disorders. And all these wonderful comments were making me... Can you... Okay, sorry. Um, okay. So basically, I, it's just fascinating. It's just I'm, I'm moved, and I'm working with eating disorders is what I was saying. So something that you said, I wrote it down. I, it was uh, for the sake of the cohesion of the unit. He, the soldier, that um, he had the trouble to say no to his friends. So he followed them going to these prostitution bars. Right. And I thought how uh, meaningful that is and how many of us, my patients, and we talk about addictions, you know, just in general, do that. And so I was thinking about patients with eating disorders specifically, again, because that's what I'm specializing in. Um, when we talk about shame and guilt, I think about, we often, they and I often have discussed lack of identity and this self-consciousness, kind of like a vacuum when, when God is not there, there is this emptiness and the question of who am I, so they start borrowing uh, some person's voice or the media's voice or whether it's a drug or the eating disorders kind of voice. And so, again, and what that, does that violate is their val- uh, values. So um, when you speak of moral driven, uh, I mean of moral injury, it just made me think of acceptance commitment therapy, which uh, like explores very much in depth how do we look for our values, how, what do we value in life, what is our idol, or do we really recognize where God is with that? So just something kind of like a thought that maybe we can all discuss at some point later. And <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I hope you're getting all of this back. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the group? Yes, Father. First, anyone else? No. Thank you, Father. That's uh, very important also. And if I can just share some of my experience working with these young women, um, they don't even want to look at me when I first arrive. They don't, because I represent God. And so they, it's not that shame and guilt, I mean, shame and spirituality don't exist. They think that they're not worthy of God anymore. They don't even want to, that God doesn't want to have anything to do with them. The they feel that God doesn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. Yeah. You know, that they've, they've so um, destroyed the expectations of them as little girls, you know, and yet none of this was, was their fault. You know, I, I, I don't want to do, to, um, to take away from, you know, the military soldiers, but there's an analogy here that, you know, we, we're raised with certain expectations by our parents and our church, and now the U.S. government for soldiers is, is expecting something very different. Mm-hmm. And for these young women, their handlers are expecting something very different, you know, in a way that touches them personally. And so this, uh, this idea of bringing them back to spirituality is a very slow process, at least it is for me. So. Thank you so much, Father. We'll keep an eye on these therapies then. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Mina Messia. I uh, don't have the burden uh, slash privilege of doing uh, all the work that you guys are doing with, you know, eating disorders and 
uh, trafficking and uh, vets. Uh, but there's a trickle down uh, to how we approach people that aren't struggling with these catastrophic things. Mm-hmm. So in the general population, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, primary care and with psychology, but also in our churches, serving our youth, serving our high school students, serving our college students, they have the same sort of struggle. They have the same sort of cognitive dissonance of, you know, I'm a good boy, but I did this bad thing and I can't reconcile this, so I must be a bad boy, and therefore I will do all these other bad things because I've already broken this <laughs> perception of myself as being a good boy. I, I think the, the nice thing about being scientific about it and, and presenting papers about it and talking about it in sort of the secular lay public is that it validates the wisdom and it validates the truth of orthodox Christianity, right? Because if it's just true in our communities, it's only true for uh, the Egyptians, it's only true for the Greeks, it's only true for the Bulgarians, it's only true for the Antiochians, and it's a cultural thing. It's not really truth. It's not really wisdom. But if it's generalizable, and you write a scientific paper about it that says shame and guilt are not appropriate in treating someone who is hurt, then that truth becomes generalizable and it's not cultural and it's not just because, oh, well, it's only because you believe in God. Well, no, God exists whether you believe in him or not and shame and guilt are not appropriate for someone who's hurt. Regardless of how bad it is, they perceive the thing that they did was. So, oh, I lied to my mom one time. That's it. That The whole house of cards comes crashing down or do we say listen, okay, you're not a liar, you lied. This is not a generalizable thing, and there's a reason that you feel bad, and there's a good place where that comes from. Like, you pulled the trigger and you killed this person. Let's talk about why you feel bad about that, because there's, that's coming from a good place, not from a bad place. So even when we're not dealing with these really heavy, difficult things that I'm not capable, trained, um, you know, I... I feel a little bit out of place with all these um, uh, you know real warriors and servants and, and but dealing with people that maybe not quite so far um, hurt with with crazy things also have the same sort of cognitive dissonance and have the same sort of removal from their ability to engage God and it's almost more dangerous in their case because it's not even recognized and it's sort of like a slow slippery slope, but it has to be approached kind of the same way with the, you know, let's talk about why you feel bad, and let's get rid of the feeling bad, let's get rid of the guilt first, so then we can address the same way. Yeah, that's good. (laughs) I'm Kate McRae. And I just wanted to kind of synthesize a few of the themes that we're discussing here and bring it back to the Orthodox context and community. So mentioning that, you know, the bulk of Orthodox parishioners, like Mina so appropriately, I think, honed in on, um, kind of we're very uncomfortable. We have no experiences to leverage to be able to authentically engage with someone who's faced trauma and combat. Um, but we do have this incredible moral tradition, right? So how, how do we resource that? And I think one of, the, one of the key points that I'm sort of hearing in the way that we're discussing um, community and the idea of being a sort of therapeutic support system as a parish is that the orthodox way of thinking of personhood and the development of the self is constitutive, not individualistic, right? So... While this individual, you know, uh, Mina, you gave an example of like a youth, you know, kind of maybe stumbling upon their first sin for the first time and how that radically alters their engagement with the edifice of the tradition, you know, and thinking, I have fallen from every rubric I have ever heard from any corner of the tradition. I'm not worthy. From that sort of end of the spectrum all the way to someone who has faced um, a moral fracturing because they didn't have the ability to say no in a situation of 
um, military work or sex trafficking. Um, all along that spectrum, we are, as a community, responsible to support the development of who that person is over the course of the life cycle. And orthodoxy doesn't represent um, becoming a person in an isolated way, you know? I think, and, and in that way, all of us who haven't had these experiences are still actively engaged in the therapeutic process by not only praying for, but also actively um, and confessionally becoming people who can be receptive to these stories and who can hold place and be witnesses and say, you know, through our actions as well as our words, um, this world has fallen and what happened to you is not the, the final say on who you are as a person. All of us are still um, morally developing. And the reason why I wanted to point that out is because um, secular rubrics for treatment for mental health disorders or a whole host of conditions are often given in an individualized way. So the, the human being is responsible for their moral will and they're responsible for, um, through an act of will, accessing those values again through just pure effort. You know, and we have this neoliberal tradition in North America that really emphasizes the pull yourself up by the bootstrap sort of ethic, right? But orthodoxy represents something totally counter to that. Right. And so it's, it's an act of each, each parishioner together to counter that sort of secular um, idea of the self and to constantly be re-engaging with tradition and seeing how the, the patristic tradition and matristic tradition calls us to be a community of care. Thank you. Very nicely said. Reminds me of a story uh, in one of Metropolitan Ware's books. I don't remember which one. It tells a story of an evangelical Protestant minister who goes to Mount Athos to see what all this stuff's about. He gets in there and he gets, you know, one of these all-night vigils and then into orthros and liturgy and hours in the church. And at the end, everybody goes up to kiss the abbot's hand. And the abbot's a little tiny man, hundred years old or so, top hat, long beard. He's the last guy in there, and everybody kisses the hand, and he goes up to the metro. Can't stand it, he said. Brother, is Jesus your personal savior? <laughs> he said, oh, no. I share him with everybody. <laughs> Which is the point. In Orthodox, we're saved together. We're a church. We support each other. One last question from the president here. It's just sort of a comment on what you said. I mean, I think ex what you said is exactly right. And I think what we um, need to remember is that the orthodox concept, the, the theology of personhood, actually plays into this really well. I mean, we are persons in relationship. So, so it is relationship that governs that. And I think that relationship involves speech, it involves talking about things. And we believe in confession because you're actually putting words onto the things that you've done wrong. Well, when people have had these, you know, sort of big things that they feel heavily on their conscience, I think that that that, that, that feeling of personhood, that relationship is somehow destroyed. And the only way they're going to achieve it again is by talking, confessing, and it's not just confessing to the confessor, which is a sacramental event, but it's also trying to have that relationship return to normal. And it be, returns to normal by talking. So when Al Rossi is saying yesterday, be an attentive listener, I think that's part of what we have to do is to give people the chance to talk and reestablish that relationship and recover their personhood in the process. So, so I think exactly what you said is right, and that's how our church's community can function. All right, thank you, everyone. The, uh, Michael, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. We now have